a, a bunch of mixers for the remix competition and he got a bit carried away and so he's kind of on his way down so in the meantime i'm going to step in and say hi peter He's just been signing some autographs, so make an orderly queue, everybody. Um, so Johnty's on his way. I'm just going to wing this. Um, have you been to Brazil many times in the, over the last few years? Uh, yes, we started coming in 1983, <coughs> 84. Yeah, but as, as a DJ in the since. last few years? Um, no, I've been coming as a DJ for nearly 10 years now. Right. What yeah, do you make of the time. crowds? The uh, people are wonderful, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, when we first got here with New Order, the strangest thing was, was that we were playing to about... 4,000, 5,000 people, and in England we were only doing 500. <laughs> so it was a big, big leap, and so for us it's always been a great market. Yeah. Have you noticed how electronic music's growing over the last few years? I mean, because for me, I've only done the country for the last five years, and I've ah. seen an amazing explosion of stuff. Well, I mean, the, the interesting thing with regards to me is, is that I suppose I was there at the birth of yeah. electronic music yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I've watched well, it become it, really, um, I, well yes I did help bring it <laughs> into the world uh, along with the Hacienda with Acid House I suppose we, you could say that we are largely <laughs> or smallly uh, responsible for it so yeah I mean it's a tool isn't it you know the thing about electronic music is the fact that people can make it on their own yeah. which is one of the um, pluses and one of the minuses yeah well, exactly. There's no quality control, right? Well, I wouldn't go that far. Um, I, I'd, I'd go that I've always been used to um, uh, working in a group format with people. And yeah. to me, the interesting thing... All right, mate. Glad you could make it. <laughs> I'll just hand over to Jonty now. These Mancunians are always late. Sorry about that. I used to be a Mancunian. I'm more of a Londoner. I'm a uh, Berliner, actually, these uh, days. Oh, good for you. Good, to, right. good to see you. Yeah, and been, you? Been a, quite a long time. So about being late, uh, I'm, pff, never happened before, but uh, <laughs> first time for everything. So I've got loads and loads of questions for you. Oh, good. Um, hopefully not the same questions Gary's asked. Uh, starting he up. was really interesting. I don't want to put any pressure on you. He's a very he interesting guy. Very insightful. I'm like a, right like to a, the hub he was. Uh, he's, you're he's, gonna, he's, you have to go some. Well, I've got some very, 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 <laughs> very deep questions for you that I'm going to save a bit for later. Uh, just starting off. You're here for DJing, I know you're going to Australia to do a light tour. Yep. Yep. Um, for you, everybody knows you as a performer, as a musician, as New Order, Joy Division, Peter Hook. For DJing, how do you view the whole DJing thing? Is it the same thing? Is it different? Are you, what's your whole mindset? Well, getting paid to play your own music is pretty good. Being paid to play other people's music is excellent, I'd say. The, the interesting thing is that when I, when I first approached G Dick, when I first approached DJing, um, I was very flippant about it. You know, I was very awkward, very... Um, I used to like to wind the crowd up by mm -hmm. playing really odd things. Johnny Cash, really weird, stupid stuff. And um, it soon made me click in to realise that everyone was there, really, to have a great time. Right. And I think that the role of the DJ is quite underplayed because when the audience has a great night... They, they think it's them. <laughs> and if they have a bad night, it's the DJ. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so, I mean, there is that aspect to it. But no, I mean, I've, I've enjoyed DJing. Uh, I think when, I, when New Order split up in 2006, I needed a break. Uh, and it was actually nice to do something on your own because DJing is quite solitary. Maybe people don't realise you're playing to thousands and thousands of people, but you travel alone, you spend a lot of your time alone. Has anybody got a violin? No. A lot of DJs in the house are in no, lonely, we've got violin a lonely sample. room. <laughs> a violin sample. Um, yeah, so I mean, it is a different way of working. Mm -hmm. uh, musically, I find that there's just so much music, it's very, very difficult to, to wade through it. So I know most DJs, um, I know there are a lot of DJs. How many, how many people in the room are DJs out of interest? Yeah, like half everybody, pretty much. I put myself up too. I mean, most DJs, you know, they're on a weekly cycle of playing new releases, of looking for the best promos. Are you in a similar way with the DJ? Are you no, I, I have uh, great trouble myself being what is termed a celebrity uh, DJ. Uh, people expect you to, to play New Order right. all the time and Joy Division all the time. And yet it's quite odd because it's like the last thing that I want to play. So you, you, you have to find a way to please them. Mm -hmm. and please yourself and generally I do that by having uh, a lot of new mixes of existing songs 
that I feature uh, to make me happy because there's, you know, playing the same stuff every night just it drives you insane and you can't do it. But the, it's, it, it, depend, it becomes a, um, do you give the people what they want or do you give the people what they expect or are you the, um, the entrepreneur, are you the pioneer, do you have to educate them? It does get into a little bit of that. But I mean, you know, you, you muddle through it. DJing is a weird one. I find that um, sometimes I have a lot of really bad ones together and then I'll go, I'm not doing it again. They're a bunch of bastards. <laughs> Luckily, I've had two on the trot that were really good uh -huh, okay. this week uh, and I'm feeling very positive about it. Good, you know? good, good. I mean, I'm different to um, what I'd term most DJs mm. who concentrate on new stuff, which I'd like to do. I, I sort of um, I sort of get benefits for my heritage, but there are um, consequences because of my heritage, and I don't mind it. You, you've always been a bit ambiguous about Blue Monday. You've always <laughs> you still ever play Blue Monday? Is yeah, that? I play it all the time. Actually, okay. uh, these days uh, I play it three times. Uh, I got a wonderful remix uh, done for me by Todd Terry that was um, uh, completely unique that no one else has got. Todd didn't release it, uh, and I play that. And then I've got a wonderful mashup of Madonna, Time Goes By, with an instrumental Blue Monday, and I play that. And then I've got a really hard house version that is mega exciting, which is about 136 BPM. Okay. And I play that, so yeah, Blue Monday. Totally Blue Monday. Sadly. I'm there with it these days. I mean, what do you make of the, the, the state of club culture kind of before, before we came, I've read half of your book. Um, I've run out of time. <laughs> Which I, half? The first half. <laughs> the Joy Division book. And I've read, ah. I read the Hacienda book when that came out. And I read half of Berners' book as well. So I split reading half your book. You words. must have very strange dreams. <laughs> well, I feel like I know you up to about 1978. And no, then don't, don't be thinking you know me with <laughs> Bernard's book, please. Okay, uh, I think cool. there was more fact in Harry Potter <laughs> than uh, Bernard's book. Well, yeah. some similarities and some differences, but I'm going to dive into a, bit, a little bit on this. But uh, you guys, we talked, I interviewed you in 2001, I remember, we talked about the punk, Joy Division, uh, the punk days, and it's clear that it, it really meant an enormous amount to you and the culture of Manchester. I actually grew up in Manchester, and you talk a lot in the book about how basically violent, aggressive, and the, the, the nature of Manchester, it's a very macho kind of, who, who the fuck do you think you are kind of place, that's the way. Who are you looking at? Yeah, who are you that's looking at? Dogs exactly, yeah. exactly. But it came across from both of your books that you both really cared about punk, and you really cared about underground culture and being outsiders. And, uh, I think I think it depends on when when I was growing up, um, there were no op opportunities for a career in music. There was no music conferences. <laughs> it was completely alien concept in um, 1976. So the thing is, is that when when you became part of the musical ideal, if you like, Johnny Rotten spoke to me. I decided to listen and become a musician. And it was very difficult right from the start. It was very difficult to prove yourself as a, a musician, mainly because nobody took it seriously as a career choice. You know, my parents and everybody around me uh, were very um, negative, very scathing about your choice of career, but it made you want to fight all the more. You know, I mean, teenagers are, are very good at being stubborn. I've, I've had a few myself now. And we, we tended to stick to it because we believed in it. And it, and it was, that, that bit was easy. The believing in it was easy. The difficult bit was the going out, getting gigs, teaching yourself to be a musician, watching you didn't make too many mistakes on the way. You know, I mean, it's, it, it's interesting really that um, as I'm doing the New Order book now, and uh, I'm realizing how many mistakes we made as people because there was no education, you know. Somebody came along with a piece of paper, some guy promising you the world, and you signed it. Hey, yeah, yeah, you know, you, did, you didn't give a care about tomorrow. And the thing that I'd like to think about music education now is that not only does it teach you to be a musician, but it stops you getting ripped off, it stops you being made, taken advantage of, so that, you know, you don't make the daft mistakes that I made. Because, again, what strikes me is, um, you know, you guys, you were, you didn't have any qualifications, you didn't have any music training, uh, you were amongst 
thousands of people that were living the same sort of lives with with no particular futures and no you know no nothing bright on the horizon but for, for you and Bernard when you were first writing the first album Unknown Pleasures I mean basically from from you starting work within two years you'd created these timeless tunes and <laughs> I'm, I'm curious about I, I'm I'm a fan I have, I have you know I have to say so I still listen to, I still listen to some of this music New Dawn Phase is one of my favorite one of my favorite tracks but for you to create that kind of music how on earth did you do it I mean again because I mean there's millions of bands out there there's millions yeah. of guys all wanting to be in a band and uh, you you have to say that it's an amazing blend of um, skill talent and luck because <laughs> the thing about Joy Division and the thing about New Order that I've noticed even while I'm doing the, the book on New Order now is that we never talked about music you know we, we just went oh wouldn't it be great to sound like Kraftwerk oh right go on we'll do a song that sounds like Kraftwerk we never really spoke about it and I think that that's the gift you have when you get four musicians together it's about chemistry you know that chemistry that brings musicians together that writes those great songs is exactly the same chemistry that smashes them apart whenever in their career you know it's a very very uncontrollable aspect the chemistry of what makes people work together and the thing is is that Joy Division were a very very equal in their workload you know I Ian never told me what to play he never told Bernard he never told Steve we never told him what to do it was just a coming together in a room very subconsciously and doing it and it worked because I, I know um, I, make, I make music now and I know making a bass line dance music is all about bass lines and you're always thinking how can I get a good bass line <laughs> I mean are you are you um, were you sitting there listening to Roxy Music Records or or uh, yeah. Iggy Pop Records yeah, and I was, uh, stealing bass lines and coming out differently? Or? <laughs> no, uh, I didn't steal bass lines from Roxy Music. He's, okay. he's much too technical for me, <laughs> that guy. Um, the, well, I was, because I was doing the New Order book the other day, I noticed that I, the, the most people I stole bass lines for were hot chocolate. <laughs> if anybody knows hot chocolate, great what band, a great, great group. Well worth checking yeah. out. Like, that's the only one I can actually say. That I stole the bass line. I stole the bass line for two songs off Emma. <laughs> okay, one was Thieves song. Like Us and the other one was Every Little Counts. And you're basically taking it and then it doesn't sound doesn't sound because you can't Hopefully it. not, it doesn't yeah. sound, yeah. Yeah. Um I did I did meet Errol Brown and told him. Uh, we were in the studio together in uh, England. And I said, you know, because I'm a great fan of his. Yeah. And I said, oh, I stole the bass lines. And he went, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's good. good. I mean, I, I, Ian Curtis, I want to ask a few questions about Ian Curtis. And um, I, I was watching a video of the other day. I was posting some videos of uh, Dead Souls. And there's a, there's a video of Ian performing it. And uh, it had a couple of million views. And there's, there's Ian doing his dance. And you're on the left. And... It looks to me, maybe I'm romantic, but it looks to me like there's this magic in the air. It looks like there's this kind of energy around all of you. I mean, when you were doing those Jolly Vision gigs, were you ever feeling like that? I mean, for you being on that stage? And yeah, I mean, the, the, the payoff as a musician is the moment you're on stage. And um, the, the gigs were very dangerous in those days. You know, there was, there was loads of riot, and you said it was very macho culture. Uh, it was very um, driven by alcohol still is <laughs> but maybe not as hairy in them days there's more security now um but yeah i mean you did feel uh, as if it was you against the world and uh, you, you you we always thought we were good because ian used to tell us uh, how great we were she was always always him that was the one that would say how wonderful we are as a group and you're like oh yeah yeah you know when your boss or your leader is is that positive and that convinced how great you are you know then in all life it's that that takes you through isn't it and you you, you were very proud to back him i mean i didn't actually know what he's singing about but when i watched him i knew that he fucking meant it you know and i was like that'll do for me that's so enough for me i love the story that you you and Bernard both liked him because he he had a jacket with hate <laughs> painted on the back. I mean, were there, were there a lot of people who managed to walk him around with hate written on their backs? Or was he um, probably um, not as bright as Ian's. This was in uh, orange fluorescent paint. I mean, he was, he was rebelling yeah. against the normal 
uh, aspect and way of life. And that's what the punks did, you know. I mean, I took uh, the dog collar off the dog and started wearing it. You know, the, dog, the dog was looking smile. at me like that. <laughs> yeah, so looking like you with the spiky hair that's and all that. Like. natural. <laughs> and it was very difficult to... Um, that fashion choice then was, was dangerous, you know. It was, uh, it was rallied against. I mean, now in life, I see all the kids in England, and when they get to that age, 13, 14, 15, they choose which tribe they want to be, whether they want to be a punk or a goth or, you know, whatever. I don't know if EDM has a look. <laughs> do you think? Kind of does. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, they, they, they choose what they want to do. And um, us being the first punks, it was, it was very difficult. It was very dangerous, yeah. Yeah. Because you get a lot of trouble. Again, asking a little bit about, about uh, Ian, I'm, again, I'm quoting some of the stuff from Bernard's book. Um, the day when, uh, Ian, when, when Ian died, and uh, Bern Bernard talks about seeing a white horse just riding up to him. And this struck a chord with me. I, I uh, yes, I, if it hadn't anything to do with Bernard, it'd probably stru strike a chord with me uh, <laughs> as well. It's the, um, uh, I'm actually um, having a go at Bernard over his book because there's so many inaccuracies in it okay. so uh, it was difficult for me to see any good bits mm. because of all the shit bits uh, in it sadly um, when Ian died it, it left a huge hole in obviously the group and obviously in us and uh, you know to be honest with you we actually struggled very valiantly to fill it we, we didn't because Gillian uh, as much as I hate to say it in my opinion never came anywhere near to fill in the Ian Curtis size hole. But Steve Bernard and I did help, you know, so we managed to get through it. And it was interesting because when New Order finished in 2006, um, I realized once I was on the outside that it seemed ridiculous that we'd never celebrated anything to do with Joy Division, ever, in 30 years, nothing, not one, five, 10. It was absolutely bizarre, which was why I started celebrating Joy Division then but when you were in new order it felt the right thing to do and focusing on new order on the new group made it a huge international success it really did because i was curious about the a little bit on joy division still and, and the, the lyrics um i know you talked you talked a few times about not really absorbing what ian was talking about while he was still alive and you can see you can look back on the lyrics now and you can see the the death elements in in all in many of the tracks. Um, when you were when he had died and you were looking and thinking about these lyrics, I'm curious how that affected you. I mean, well, coming back to do the records and singing his lyrics has has been the 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 um, the veil lifter, shall we say? Because you you can sing them, you know, the way everybody sings songs, but to look at them and have to concentrate on them, I'm looking at them and thinking, oh my god. <laughs> I suppose you'd have to say there were more than a few hints here that he was unhappy. But the thing is, is that in the the way of working that we were going through, there, there were a lot more uh, older, experienced people than me, and all of us were unable to help him. I mean, he had many doctors, many parents, many professionals helping him. Really, the f three punks that were in the band with him, nobody really sought them out, you know, to get them to help him get better. Uh, and it was, it was a very, very sad affair to watch someone become that ill, you know, because he lived for the group, he lived to play, and literally the first thing the doctor said to him when he was diagnosed was, you'll have to give it all up now, you know? And that broke his heart because the last thing he wanted to do, he was just starting. And it was just becoming um, a success. So it was, it was a terrible moment for him. And he fought his illness tooth and nail right to the end. But he couldn't beat it. I mean, I, I thought there was a very telling moment in the Joy Division documentary when they took his, um, his medicines that he took along to a present-day epilepsy specialist. And the present-day specialist analyzed them and his, his report was, these were guaranteed to kill him. There were so many uppers and downers, they just didn't know enough about the illness to control it. And the guy said, quite simply, 
this will have killed him anyway without epilepsy. So, you know, it was a very sad moment. It's just good nowadays that the world has moved on, that people have become more educated about things like that. And, you know, you can help people to, to function. I mean, picking up the threads, you, you're one of the few bands or people to have been in two bands that have been, uh, you know, what they've become. Monaco weren't that bad. <laughs> And revenge as well, of course. Yeah, yeah, well, so, uh, revenge were that bad. <laughs> um, I mean, you order again. I, I know Arthur Baker a bit as well. I know he 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 kind of rides quite a key figure. Um, when you went to New York and you met, started making confusion in these tracks. Um, again, it seems to me there's always this randomness about it. You were just doing what you were doing. Is that is that pretty much how it was? We yeah. we were very lucky. Yeah, we we had two people: Tony Wilson and Rob Gretton our manager, who really didn't care in in the way that, oh, let's just go and try it. There was no, no more particular planning. You know, to fly a group to New York to work with Arthur Baker with no song in those days was pretty radical. Nowadays, it's not that radical. I mean, if someone said to me, come on, we can go and write, write a song now with a computer, you could do it in a few hours. You could get something going. It wouldn't be that difficult. But then it was really alien to uh, the way we worked, and it was really, really frightening. And we were terrified uh, of Arthur, you know, because of his, ep his reputation. And I think in a funny way, Arthur was probably terrified of us. <laughs> I think he was, yeah. yeah so when we got together, it was actually nice to go, oh, he's just like us. I mean, Arthur Baker struck me that he didn't have a clue what he was doing, but nobody on earth was going to stop him doing it. And I thought, yes. It was I like should that. gossip a bit about Arthur Baker. I, I was friends with Princess Superstar, who he produced yeah, a like few Princess years ago. Superstar, very much. And Princess Superstar told me that basically what Arthur would do would just lie in the studio like that for hours, and she'd be working away, working away, and he'd go, that's it. And that well, was all he did, pretty much. But uh, <laughs> got it with he, he wasn't like got that when we did it. Got it with worldwide he, hit, so, he was uh, a lot more uh, hands-on. Hands -on. I mean, you know, but producing is a different thing, isn't it? The produ a producer is there to get the best out of an artist. And if you had problems, that's when a producer should step in. I mean, I've worked with producers that do very little, but make great product. And I've worked with producers that do a lot and try and take over the group. Uh, and I, I know which one I prefer. You know, I, do, I think that some producers, and you know, there's good and bad in everything, isn't there? Producing's a very difficult game because you're there at the start and you're the one that's cutting the record, the band down. You know, so it's a very difficult job producing. I mean, I gave up producing um, for that reason because it, it was so time consuming. Because Arthur, Arthur had hits with uh, tracks like uh, Walking on Sunshine and mm. uh, Freeze, I yeah. O U, and had a lot of big worldwide 80s pop. Yeah, he was electric. really, really big. I mean, he, he really did. He had his own studio, Shakedown, that was world famous. Uh, he had a very nasty divorce. That's right. Which, yeah. <laughs> which is usually God's way of telling that. you you've got too much. Yeah. <laughs> because I, I was understanding that Arthur's way of working was to have lots of uh, session musicians. I, I, I once was given the parts of Walking on Sunshine and the parts are just amazing gospel singers doing incredible mm. harmonies and all sorts of bits and everybody's incredibly talented of you, you, every couldn't, you couldn't possibly feature them all though could you no you couldn't there's, there's in, amazing so bits he's left it, yeah. out i mean yeah, the, it, it was quite it was quite interesting to work with arthur because it gave you i mean i wasn't a great lover of electronic dance music then and the thing is is that he opened that up to you he showed you that you could do that quite easily i mean i was much more a died in the wall rocker i just wanted us to play because that's where i thought our strength lay uh, at that time and confusion was done very early on in our career actually 1983 you know it was how really long did confusion take to make was it it took uh, one day from start to finish from start to finish in the studio it was one day we, we literally went in the studio in um, america as we walked in the studio all the studios were booked up 24 hours they were done in th eight, three eight hour shifts in new york and as we were going in james brown was coming out so we were like that whoa was he, was he friendly to you? Or? Well, yeah, as he brushed past me on the stairs, <laughs> carrying his guitar, he seemed okay, yeah. Uh, and then we went in and we had nothing. And we started jamming. And within eight hours, but, um, Arthur had confusion. And that video is from that session? No. Oh. The, the video was taken from the American tour. 
okay. that, that we did afterwards. Arthur used to have this wonderful um, idea that what he used to do was he'd do a rough mix of the tune he was working on, and then he'd take it to a nightclub and play it. The nightclub that he used to play it in was called the Fun House in New York. And uh, John Jellybean Benitez was the DJ, and they had a, a, re a real surreal rigged up. And so the, the Arthur would mix in this mix, and he'd look at the dance floor and see if it was working. If people were dancing, he'd go, oh, I'm going the right way here. And if it started to walk off, he'd go, oh, shit, back to the drawing board. It was quite a wild way uh, to work, you know, using human guinea pigs. Because these kids at the fun house were renowned for their dancing. It was very, very much um, almost like West Side Story type thing. They had very choreographed dance moves and things like that. So, yeah, it was wild to do. We were like, whoa, this is great. Couldn't have done that in the Hacienda. Because you, you, were, you were very actively resisting having um, collaborators and guests involved. And you were stubbornly keeping it just, just you guys, the whole band. I mean, you never no, really had No, no, I mean, it was, it was always me. <laughs> and I was going, well, we're a great group. What do we need them turkeys for? <laughs> Let's just carry on being a great group. Uh, I think it was self-preservation. Um, I mean, I had a very difficult time in New Order because uh, I, I got the reputation of being the dinosaur. Oh, look, he doesn't want to change. We want to go off and work with loads of people. I'm going, fuck them off. Stick with us, you know, we're great. What do you want to go off for? It was, it was like your wife telling you you wanted to see more men. <laughs> you know, you're going, oh, come on, baby. You know, pack it in. <laughs> He's like, ah, oh, shit. So it was, yeah, it was an odd feeling. And um, you, you became a bit of a uh, stick in the mud shall we say, for wanting to, to do that. But, I mean, you know, they, we, it, it was very much a climate change. I remember some guy coming up to me in uh, 1983, 84, a very famous DJ in Manchester called Greg Wilson, uh, asking me to do a, a remix of Blue Monday. Uh, and I said, you cheeky bastard, fuck off. You're not remixing my track. <laughs> oh, you cheeky bastard. I've never been so affronted in all my life. Of course, now, you know, you live for the remixes to see what spin people put on it and what new life people put on it. But then it was the first time these things were happening. And some of them were quite shocking, especially that one in particular. <laughs> I mean, at, what, at what point did um, New Order, at what point did you, it's a phrase that jumped in my head, laying the ghost to rest of Joy Division. At what point did New Order, you think, okay, now we've put all that behind and, I mean, New Order got more well, and more you, and more successful. We, what we did with New Order when we were together was ignore it. We ignored it. We didn't play any Joy Division at all. And that was the way that we dealt with it. We didn't have anything to do with any reissues or anything like that, nothing. We literally just left it alone. What happened was, was that when we got to um, 2004, I, um, I was doing um, a cancer charity in Manchester. Uh, Bernard didn't want to do it. So I said, well, I'll do it. I'll go on with a few mates, me, Andy Rourke, guitarist out of New Order, we'll play some Joy Division songs. So then Barney changed his mind and decided to do it. So we played a Joy Division set at the Cancer Benefit. Uh, and it went really well. I mean, it was different to how we felt as New Order, but it went really well. So we decided to do it again. And we played the same set as New Order in Wembley Arena, I think it was. Uh, and when we were coming off, Barney said to me, he said, uh, I don't like that, it's miserable. Uh, and I thought, all oh, right. Uh, and we never played it again. So, I mean, it, w what he was saying was, was that in an extreme way, was that it was different to New Order. New Order, he'd written them. They were his lyrics. It was much brighter, much poppier music. Joy Division had a different feel, you know, and I, I did, I, I presumed that that's what Bernard meant when he said it was miserable. <laughs> but we never played it again. Interestingly, when we split up in 2006 and they got back together again in 2011 without me, because I'm playing Joy Division all the time, they have to play it. <laughs> So when you go and see their shows now, after all these years of ignoring it, they play it as well as me. So it's typical, isn't it? Like buses. Yes, and you get, you get yes. two coming along at once. I want to I wanna dip into some of the Hacienda stories. Uh, Hacienda, an infamous Manchester club, uh, the book. I do recommend the book, if any of you fancy reading it. It's a very, very uh, no-holds-barred, fully detailed uh, book. Uh, 
not going to too much detail, but and when the club started it, I mean, it, obviously running, it sounds like a major project from the start. Was that already, you seeing that as a plan B? Were you thinking, is this something you might do after the band? Were you, I mean, we, No, uh, no, what, what happened again. was, was that Tony Wilson, our record company uh, guy, and Rob Gretton, our manager, we'd done a wonderful tour of New York with Arthur. Arthur had taken us to these wonderful clubs that had a fantastic atmosphere. That, that were basically just a black box with a sound system and a bar. And we thought, wow, this is great, it's really vibey, but the music was really open. You know, there, there was no particularly musical policy as there was in Manchester then. And we, Rob and Tony said to us, can we have some money? We'll emulate this. Now the, the point then was, was that in Manchester, people like us, punks, had nowhere to go. The, the clubs in Manchester were dreadful in 1980. Uh, so literally we, we decided to build a club where we could go. Now the group didn't have that much to do with it. And Tony and Rob let it run away with them, uh, like a runaway horse really. Uh, they ended up with this wonderful, wonderfully, masterfully designed club. Quite undesigned to be a club, to be honest. It didn't really function very well as a club, but it was a beautiful, beautiful space. Ben Kelly's design of the Hacienda. And it cost a fortune. And the thing is, is that the first thing you learn in clubs is, is that if you want to make a small fortune, you, you should start with a big fortune. And which is exactly what we did because we lost so much money. The group only got involved in the club when it was losing. <laughs> ridiculous amounts of money they 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 couldn't they, they had this grand vision of a seven day and night club like dance uh, yeah and it cost yeah. a fortune to run and it was one thing they'd never thought of club culture with regards to venues is it, it ebbs and flows and sometimes things work for no reason and sometimes nights work for great reasons but it's very you cannot tell what's going to happen when you open the door and Rob and Tony got into this thing where the staff they had were always projecting. Oh, it's going to be great next year. We're going to get all these people through the door. And they were going, oh, yeah, brilliant. That's great, yeah. But the people were making it up. And they didn't know. <laughs> and of course, when you open the club and you open the door, nobody came. She was like, I thought you said it was going to be full. Mm, well, OK. You know. Hey, what do I know? You're like, what the hell? So they, they, they surrounded themselves by are by idiots, really. And they didn't know enough about it to make it work. So the group only got involved when it was on its arse. And we'd lost, we'd lost by that point something like four million. Four million. By the time, plus committed tax fraud over and over again. So the tax man was investigating us. We were all screwed, basically. It was amazing we, we got away from it. And the only reason we got out of it was by writing another great record, which earned us enough money to get out of the tax problems. So what were you spending your time, because New Order, again, from reading all the interviews, and you guys were not really getting along. Uh, uh, um, no, the, the, the not getting along bit didn't really... Didn't matter? No, 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 not that it didn't matter. Uh, it was about 85, 86. It all sort of came together, unfortunately. It came together with Acid House and the problems that the Hacienda was having, financial problems, meant that the group had to work Bernard did not like working. Uh, he loved going in the studio, but he didn't like the, the grind, as he put it, of touring, uh, of everything that went with it. He seemed to enjoy it at the time, which was the odd bit. You know, when I saw him after a gig, he certainly didn't have his head in his hands. He seemed to be running around topless, um, chasing a load of young girls, in my opinion. <laughs> Looked like he was having a great time to me. But he kept telling us he was having a bad time. Um, so what happened then was he resented touring to fund the Hacienda. And um, it, it was that that brought the, the bad feeling, if you like, together. You weren't doing it just for you. You were doing it to keep factory records going and the Hacienda going, because what had happened was it's really boring. When he formed the Hacienda, Rob signed a lot of personal guarantees. So the thing is, is that if the Hacienda went bust, they came and took everything off you and he made us sign them. Okay. So we stood to lose everything if the Hacienda didn't succeed. 
So that was what you tried and tried very valiantly. The other group members gave up in about 1987 and I carried on with Rob until 1997. And I did think of it as another career, yeah, I was hoping. Because I mean, reading, reading the book, you're describing partying very, very hard. <laughs> Friday to Sunday, the full Thursday to Saturday. Thursday to Thursday to Monday, where, um, mm. absolutely raving like there's no tomorrow. Very much living for the day, which I guess most people go raving tend to live for the day. But then you've got pressure like that hanging over your shoulders. I mean, how did you manage to kind of cope with that week after week after week? Uh, the you see the the business pressures were, were bad in the hacienda. The the big problem was the gang pressures, the violence, the, you, you couldn't deal with that. You could deal with the business pressures. All you had to do was stay sober, get in there and sort it out, you know, do a couple of tours, do another record. You could sort that out. But having 17-year-old kids running around with Uzis in a nightclub, you, you, how, how, how the hell are you supposed to do that? The police weren't interested. The police actually used to, um, I remember meeting, I, I met a policeman years later, uh, and he said to me that the highlight of the police shifts that they used to do was between 10 and 2 on a Saturday night because they knew where every twat in Manchester was in the Hacienda. So they all used to be sat there in the station going, ah, oh, we can relax. <laughs> Let them deal with the nutters. You know, and it was like that on a Thursday, Friday, Saturday. The police were grateful to us for putting all these lunatics in one place. Uh, where they could hopefully kill each other. Uh, so you, you, you did the only thing you could really, you know, you tried to help and you self-medicated. You know, I was pissed as a fart. And someone had come into the office and go, oh, there's a kid running around the cocktail bar, you know, with a knife and you go, oh, God. Not again. And then you'd have to get your 50 bouncers and your 20 Alsatian dogs. And we'd all have to go down there and try and sort out this ridiculous mess. It was just unbelievable. You know, it was such... Uh, it was so difficult. I can't, I can't explain that feeling of helplessness and hopelessness that you have. And if you'd have been sober, you'd have run a mile. It was only because we were all pissed, all off it, that we managed to actually sit there and contain it and try and, you know, work it out. And I don't know whose great idea it was to sort out the problems, but we decided to hire the um, second best bunch of lunatics in Manchester and put them on the door. So the second best bunch of lunatics then could try and marshal the first best bunch of lunatics that were trying to get in the door, and it just became like a war. But it was made it very exciting. <laughs> you literally didn't know whether you were gonna live or die when you went through the door, you know, it was like, fucking hell, come on! Man yeah, Manchester's, a, Manchester's a horrible place. Man. Oh, it, it's, it was really just... It was a horrible place. It was insane. Uh, that period was... I mean, it's not like that now. The police wouldn't entertain it. They couldn't get away with the way they left you to it. Tony Wilson used to go literally on his hands and knees to the police commissioner and to the mayor of Manchester and beg for help, you know? Because it was me, him, Tony Wilson, a few bouncers, trying to sort out these nutters, and they, they never helped. And you know, in a, in a funny way, it's like someone knocking on your door and going, I wonder if you can help me, I'm being chased by a load of lunatics with guns and machetes. And you're gonna go, oh! <laughs> you know, most people's reaction would be to just shut the door and put the bolt on, wouldn't they? How did, it, you, it was how did you manage, um, how do you manage to not, I mean, you're a high profile person, I guess, very easy for you to offend some 17 year old kid who's, who's wanting to make a reputation by saying, I'm, I punched Peter Hook and he, I kicked well, him yeah, or whatever. Luckily for me, because I'm from Salford uh, and I kept my roots there very much, uh, the people in Salford who were the first biggest bunch of nutters in the Hacienda actually had um, respect for you. I mean, they, they did, ha all the gangs had a lot of respect for the musicians. You know, I, in, in the Hacienda there were five alcoves and you could only go in the alcoves if you were a gang member and they couldn't go between alcoves. So if you were in alcove five with Ensure, you couldn't go in alcove four, Cheetah Mill, because they'd kick off. 
But the musicians, me, Manny, Ian Brown, Sean Ryder, Barney, we could go in any of them. <laughs> and they'd all go, hey, okay, hey, have half a knee, you know, have a line, whatever. And so you, you sort of crossed every boundary by being a musician. It was insane. And we got away with murder, so you never had a problem like that. And don't forget the doormen were working for us as well. So you 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 did have a lot of um, backup. Right? Yeah, yeah, you had a lot of people looking after you. But I mean, I I, I was never a fighter anyway, in in that way. Mm. You know, if somebody came at me, obviously I would, but not in a, a gang format. You know, you weren't doing that. But it was horrible to witness. You know, some of the things you saw were were absolutely obscene. And I know that Rio, um, in in Brazil, Sao Paulo, and places like that, you have your own problems, and you see these things every day. But it was basically a favela in the club. So the club was the, the, the favela and everything went on in it, you know, and the police wouldn't come in it. It was, it was unbelievable. Mm. So when the club closed, presumably it was a relief, I guess, by the end of... Oh, God, yeah. I mean, it was a huge relief. The, uh, I'd been supporting it myself, the club, for the last year. It's costing me £7,000 a month to keep open so that I wouldn't lose my house because they, they would have taken my house off me. We had to find a um, buyer for the building. Um, the club never made any money. I don't think it made any money in the 17 years that it was open. Never, not a penny. <laughs> yeah, and yet it lost, we reckoned upwards, of 14 million pounds. 14 million pounds. Yeah. Wow. We, we entertained a whole city at our own expense <laughs> for 16 years. Beat that. <laughs> let's um let's bring it back a bit to the present um we're living in this world of edm and music conferences all over the place and mega yeah. festivals yeah and you were i have a quote from you that oh I'm no, no don't be have a quote from me and for you because i was going to say you must be hating all the cdm music but no you were saying you were comparing david guetta and calvin harris to arthur baker uh in the way they were remixing about. And I'm curious, how do you see how do you see EDM? Has it has it changed? Has it affected you? Have you got? Well, the, the the interesting thing is is that being there in 1984 when Acid House began to be accepted in Manchester and dance music from Detroit, Chicago, and then watching it go huge, 87, 88. I mean, it's interesting to note that a lot of the dance music now li literally stems from that period, you know, people like David Goetta, Calvin Harris, who were the huge gods of it all, um, quite, you know, say quite openly that they were inspired by the house musicians of 1988. To me, I must say that now you're going through a period where a lot of dance music sounds a lot like Hacienda music from 89, 90, 92. It's got all those, those pianos, the offbeat pianos and stuff like that. It's got a real feel of that period to it. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm, I love it. I love EDM. I love clubs. I love DJing. I'm having a great time. And that's what it's all about. And the thing is, is that here we come together in a way to, to celebrate that and to try and analyse it. But I think that the, the one thing I've learned about music is, is that you can't analyse it. it. It just happens. Sometimes two people can go in the studio and they can create something awful. Sometimes two people can go in and create something beautiful. But the thing is, I suppose, and the, the ultimate thing has to be that at least you tried. And in life, as long as you can sit there and go, well, at least I tried. That's what, to me, life is all about. Getting on and getting on with it. And now, you know, when I went to see my careers master and um, asked him or told him that I wanted to be a musician, and he hit me around the head and told me not to be so stupid. <laughs> It's different now, isn't it? Now you can learn and you can learn and work to get a career in this wonderful, wonderfully exciting business, which it still is. And I'm still in awe of it and still very, very glad actually to be a part of it. You know, I never thought, when we were punks, we wanted to get rid of all the old farts. That was our, our mission, get rid of all the old farts. And now I'm an old fart, I'm thinking, thank God I didn't get my own way. <laughs> um. Do you, still, do you still feel um, any sense of any affinity with being a punk? Do you still see yourself as a punk in any way? Do you yeah, well, I mean, you know, to me, punk is about attitude and it's about being true to yourself and doing the way things the way that you want to do them. Uh, and that's what it's about. Johnny Rotten, 
my interpretation of what Johnny Rotten and the Sex Pistols were doing were, were just doing what they wanted to do because it was very staid, it was very boring, and I just loved the trouble that they were causing. And we did become those awkward, awkward musicians that always wanted things their own way. That's what New Order became. We, all, we you know, our thing was doing everything our own way. And, and that's what you fight for, you know, because you don't want anyone to take advantage of you. You want to, to lead, you don't want to be led. Uh, and it's a movement. I mean, it was such a fantastic movement, punk. You know, and the fact that YouTube wasn't there to capture it was another great moment, because I don't think it'd be as special if we could all just sit there and watch it. There is little, but not a lot. And uh, nowadays, you can literally watch everything. And I'm not too sure it makes it more exciting. Well, in Berlin, they don't allow cameras in a lot of the best clubs. So oh, good. I, 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 I bloody know why, I know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I can tell you a few stories about them as well. <laughs> I could go on this Later. Part. I want to I wanna question some of the crowd, because I'm sure everyone in the crowd may have some questions. So, questions from the crowd, anybody? Shout, please. That's a good question. Uh, we haven't got a translating thing. No, can you try in English? Yes, uh, Arthur Baker. Um, I mean, Arthur's a, an interesting DJ in the way that he does his craft, and um, I must have I must admit that uh, I've watched him empty <laughs> many a room. Um, and yeah, you know, I mean, you you do watch my my mentor for learning to DJ was Manny out of the Stone Roses. Uh, I went on a DJ. My first ever DJ gig was with Manny, and. I said to Manny, well, w what should I do? And he said, well, just stand there and look pretty. And I thought, well, I can manage that. So anyway, on the night, we were a little bit refreshed, shall we say, and it was going well. It was in a club in Barcelona called Razamataz. Big room, 1,000 people. And Manny was DJing away, and I was stood there looking pretty. And Manny was scratching one of the records. But it wasn't switched on. So he was putting all this effort. Uh, and I said, Manny, 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 it's not switched on. It's not switched on. Uh, so anyway, then the other record stopped. So he's <laughs> with his headphones on. And the crowd were, then they started throwing drinks. And there was bottles and things coming over. And I'm like, Manny, fucking hell. And he went, oh. And then he noticed. And he went down to his record bag, grabbed a record out and started throwing it at the audience. <laughs> and I thought, I could do that. <laughs> so that, that, that was how I started DJing. I thought, I could throw fucking records at the audience if they want to pay me. <laughs> Fantastic. It's important skill to have. <laughs> uh, and then I'd play with Arthur and I'd see his attitude and I'd watch other, music, uh, other DJs doing it. You see, it's interesting, you see, in a, in a group format, Groups hate each other. They, they stay very insular in the people in the group and they don't really mix. It's very competitive. And I thought DJing was going to be like that. When I became a DJ, everyone's really friendly, really nice and very helpful to me anyway. And um, I, I got the shock of my life. I was like, whoa. Because I think the thing is about a DJ is quite a solitary um, existence. Whereas in a group, you've always got a bunch of friends to, to protect you. So the thing is, is that DJing is, you, you, you can get quite intimidated. I mean, I've been bowled off loads of times. You know, if you, if you play a club and it's the wrong music for the club, you're just out. I, I, I can tell, I can sit down in a club for half an hour and I can go, I'm going to be out of here in 10 minutes. You know, because of the music. I can tell that the, pe the, the music that the people in the area like is not what I play, is not what I'm going to play. So I know that I'll be having a terrible gig. <laughs> and it usually works. You know, I mean, um, God, many places, even Las Vegas, I DJed in Las Vegas. And um, I, I, was, I was listening to the warm-up DJ who knew the crowd, and I thought, I'm fucked. 
And lo and behold, 10 minutes, I was, I was back in my room. <laughs> got paid though, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I got, I got paid to be um, insulted. But yeah, it's, it's, it, what, what I like about DJing is it's very unpredictable. When, when you play with the group, when I play with my group, the audience are there to see you. And literally, you, you, you would have to be bad to do it wrongly. But when you DJ, every audience is completely new in, in my genre anyway. And so you, you, you have to win them over. And sometimes it's very, very nerve wracking. I get much more nervous before DJing than I do before playing. Because you've got to win the crowd. It's, it's a hell of a, it's, it's tough. You know, sometimes it can be very tough. Okay, I'm going to ask one, one question. I have to go off and do another panel, so I'm going to oh, run right, away okay. from you. Uh, what's been the happiest period of your career life? <laughs> uh, the happiest now. Uh, I'm having a great Good. time. Um, I enjoy playing with my son, who plays bass with me. Uh, and I'm still getting offers to... Uh, it's, it's been hard work, don't, don't get me wrong. Um, yeah, I get offers to do loads and loads of things. It's absolutely fantastic. If I could reconcile this thing with New Order because it's a legal case that needs to be finished. I, my life would be plain sailing, but I suppose you do need something, don't you, in life to get you going. Push against, yeah. 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 Okay. So am I staying or are you going? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. I'll go on, ask another question. Oh. Oh, Hello. 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 Uh, um, I read the, your history and... Most of time you said that uh, your career was based with hard work and some time with he some hectic times. And uh, as the actual generation seek to, to, to have a, a, a quick return in career and fame, uh, what message you can bring to us to in, in case in, in time that we we have problems or we have fails and keep trying yeah, how do you how do you get up again again and again and again and again and again, and again, and again? Be because i do because my mother my mother taught me to get up again she said to me don't stand for that get going you know she wouldn't there there was no wallowing with my mother she just used to kick you up the arse and send you out again and that it's as simple as that. I mean, you know, the thing about this business is there's no secret to anything to do with music. The secret is, is that you have to carry on. As soon as you stop, you're fucked. You're gone. You've got to keep, you've got to do the next thing, you've got to do the next thing. And my wife says to me, when I get these offers, and some of them are crazy, like coming here, what a crazy offer, why we would want to come here talk in that wonderful, wonderful talk place of Rio outside on their doorstep. Um, you know, the, it, it's, it's interesting. I, I love the job that I managed to make a career of. And it's a very difficult... To make a full-time career in music in these days is still very difficult. You know, a lot of people do it, but they have a, another job as well. Uh, so I'm very lucky that I can still manage to do it. And yeah, I get up every day. I'm very bloody-minded. That's all it is. Fuck them. I'm out there. <laughs> Fuck them. I'm out of here too, Peter. Thank you very much, Peter.